So I, I really appreciate having the opportunity to share Organovo's story um, here at Stem Cells on the Mesa. I think this is our third year participating here, um, and it's a great forum uh, to have some of the discussions that have been going on already today. Um, Organovo is a 3D human biology company. We're really focused on building 3D human tissue models um, out of cells with architectural control. And we're doing this leveraging a proprietary 3D bioprinting platform um, that I'm going to share a little bit about how that works for us. Um, we are a publicly traded company, so here's the obligatory safe harbor statement. Um, the company was founded in 2007 and opened doors in San Diego in 2009. Um, since that time, we've really worked to develop further a technology that was in license from the University of Missouri, which was initially funded with a $5 million NSF grant. Um, really aimed by Dr. Gabor Forgotch at the University of Missouri at um, developing an automatable system that enabled the placement of cells, of living cells. And that was really the foundation of, of bioprinting. And we have continued to develop that platform and move beyond you know, how to make a bioprinter to how to make the tissues and use the tissues. And I'll share with you a little bit today of where we've been as a company. Um, some. Uh, a little bit more background on the company. You know, we really are um, the commercial leader in 3D printing of tissues. Everything that we make is either made solely out of cells or predominantly out of cells, and I'll share some examples um, today with you about that. Um, over the summer, we did complete a $46 million offering um, and listed on the New York Stock Exchange. So in addition to taking our technology platform and really focusing and developing applications that we have deemed have market value, we also work with a variety of partners. We work with foundations, we work with pharmaceutical companies, and we work with academic institutes to develop very specific tissue models, um, in some cases for modeling specific aspects of disease, um, and in some cases more focused on tissue engineering for implantable surgical grafts. So there's no mystery, really, I think, for most of the people in this room that there is a lot of room for improvement in the way that we use cells and tissues and the way that we make decisions and the type of products that come forward. Um, if you look out there today, the data supports um, very strongly that there's room for improvement. Um, the phase three and, and late clinical stage failures of drugs, um, very prevalent um, reality here. Um, with more than 27% of drugs failing because of lack of, uh, lack of efficacy and toxicity issues. And then you take that a stage uh, further, and if you look at all the people who are on the transplant list waiting for organs, um, there's really certainly not enough tissues to service all the patients that could benefit. And so there's no question, I think, in anybody's mind that's here today that there's an opportunity to develop better models and to use those models both in the drug discovery arena and in the therapeutic, um, therapeutic tissue arena. So if you look at the drug development process, and, and here we might include cells as drugs too, as cell therapies are, are often considered, all the way at the beginning of the drug discovery process when we're doing experiments and making decisions about which biochemical pathways are active and what the targets are or are not in, in the drug development process, we're making decisions largely based on cell lines that are cultured in 2D on plastic and have very little, uh, very little recapitulation of what in vivo tissues really have going on inside of them. And so you could say that this process is working pretty well um, as an industry, or um, you could let the data speak for itself and say that maybe there's room for improvement. So if you look over the course of the last two years, there have been upwards of 13 drugs pulled from the market or late stage clinical trials because of unpredicted toxicity. And going back to the work of Mina Bissell and some other folks that have been working for decades in this space, the data is amassing to suggest that the 2D models by which we make a lot of decisions don't really recapitulate the in vivo environment. And if you move to three-dimensional models and three-dimensional models of tissues that contain multiple cell types, you get more intelligent answers. The problem is today, there really hasn't been, up until today, there really hasn't been a way to make those types of models and use those in the, in the drug development arena. Um, and so we are talking this morning a little bit about the things that 
uh, maybe keep you up at night and things that keep you worried. And, and what I want to share with you now is the reason that I get up in the morning and come into work is the opportunity of maybe doing something different and asking these questions in a different way. I find that very exciting. So if you agree that three-dimensional models of living human tissues might provide better answers than, than cell lines on plastic, there's a lot of different ways that people try to get there, and I'm going to try to highlight some of the differences between some of those ways and, and the way that we operate at Organovo. Um, you can certainly make spheroids aggregates of cells by placing cells together. They will cluster and make little spheroids of cells. You can take cells and put them onto three-dimensional porous scaffolds and get three-dimensionality that way. You can make patterned monolayer cultures where cells are specifically located in various places on the plastic surface. Um, and then you can bioprint tissues. And when you apply the filter of, is it truly three-dimensional? And for, that, for us, that means it's greater than 200 microns in, in its smallest dimension. Um, are multiple cell types present? And are those cell types present in a way that is architecturally controlled? Do you put specific cells in specific places relevant to each other, just as they would be in the body? And is it, is it reproducible? Is it automatable? Um, can you make many of them and make them in a format that someone could use in a screening platform? And when you apply those filters, our space becomes very unique. So the way the printing process works, um, the printer itself sits in a standard biosafety cabinet. And we work with multicellular building blocks generated from human cells. And we're always printing with little building blocks that are multiple cells each. And having the cells together with each other kind of helps them survive the printing process. The printer will lay down on a user-specified pattern. So every tissue has patterns, and you can go into the software, reproduce those patterns in the software, and then the printer will place these little building blocks of cells adjacent to each other layer by layer and build the tissue up layer by layer. It's a lot like the 3D fabrication that you see um, out there uh, in the lay press on making plastic objects, except for instead of working with little balls of polymer, we're working with little balls of living cells. So when you put adjacent bioink um, uh, building blocks next to each other, they will fuse and form a contiguous piece of tissue provided that the microenvironment therein is permissive for that. Um, and so what you get once you place these little building blocks and they fuse over a period of about 24 hours is an actual living tissue. This is fully cellular that you can take a section of and see that it looks and feels very much like a living tissue. So we've worked with tissues from throughout the body. Uh, we've worked with cardiomyocytes and printed cardiovascular tissue. Uh, we're doing work, and you may have heard a little bit from uh, Dr. Joseph Carroll at the Oregon Health Sciences University this morning in our partnership with OHSU, uh, printing um, structures that are relevant to oncology, being able to compartmentalize the stroma and the epithelium of a tissue and have microvascular networks so that you can actually study tumors as if they are tumors and not just monolayers on plastic. We've done a lot of work with vascular systems, and I'll share a little data at the end on that. We've printed um, mesenchymal stem cells in three-dimensional structures and then differentiated those into bone. Uh, peripheral nerve conduits have been made from Schwann cells. We've done some work with skeletal muscle. I'm going to share um, a good bit of data, actually, on our first uh, product that will be released in 2014, which is our bioprinted liver. Um, and we've also done a fair amount of work in lung uh, modeling the small airway. So essentially, we can work with tissues from throughout the body. We can focus on making something recapitulate the normal situation, or we can focus on making something reproduce certain aspects of a disease process. So focusing a little bit on our, our liver uh, program, this is work that was done uh, largely by some scientists in the group, one of whom is here today, Ben Shepard and Justin Robbins um, over at Organovo. Um, we can take the, the building blocks of liver cells and here we're working with several different cell types from the liver, stellate cells, endothelial cells, and hepatocytes, which are kind of the workhorse metabolic cells of the liver. I and mean, we can print structures that recapitulate the lobulated pattern of the liver. And if you were to take a cross-section of this structure, this is the bioprinted structure at the gross level, if you were to look into the tissue, you can see that the hepatocytes, which are shown here in blue, um, have very clear uh, borders with hepatic stellate cells and endothelial cells incorporated. And so we can create these compartments within the tissue in the full thickness of that tissue, which when it's first printed is around 500 microns. So if you notice the histologies, these are cross sections through the tissue. All cells are touching other cells, just like they would in your body. 
Um, you get very nice intercellular junctions, which is shown here with the cadherin staining between the hepatocytes. And we see here formation of microvascular networks within the tissue, the CD31 staining. Um, and so what we have is essentially taking the raw materials of only cells and producing something that looks very much like a liver tissue would in vivo um, with certain aspects of things. And we can source cells from a variety of places. We've done most of our work with primary hepatocytes, um, but we can also use progenitor cells like the HEPRGs and IPS-derived hepatocytes, which I'll show a little bit of data from later. So it's great when something looks like a particular tissue, but the, the second question is always, how is the function? And so here what we've done is actually take this tissue and ask a series of biochemical questions. Does this tissue function and make proteins like a liver would? Um, and what we're looking at here is production of albumin, very important liver-specific protein in the body, fibrinogen involved in blood clotting. And we can also see synthesis of cholesterol in the tissues over time. All of these features are something that's lost in primary liver cells when you first take them out of the body and put them in culture on plastic. Within 48 hours, most of these functions are very much gone, diminished. And in particular, cytochrome P450 activity is lost very quickly after you take liver cells out of the body. And what we're showing here is five days after the tissues are fabricated, we are still getting inducible cytochrome P450s, 1A2 and 3A4, which are the two big metabolic enzymes in the body. Um, and so what we're, what we're essentially able to say is that we can, we can print the liver and we can see the liver retain its liver-like functions over extended periods of time in vivo. Um, here, what we've done is take um, IPS-derived hepatocytes and print the structures substituting the IPS cells for the primary hepatocytes and show that we can print the structures, that we still get the same formation of microvascular networks and the same beautiful morphology, and we still get the same function although a little bit diminished from what we would get with primary hepatocytes, is very stable over time. And if you compare expression and production of the albumin in the tissue um, in the 3D environment, the bioprinted tissue versus the 2D controls, where all the, still cell, all the cell types are still present, but they're just not configured in the three-dimensional tissue, um, the function is greatly enhanced in the 3D printed tissue. So we, we always get the question of, so how long can you push these tissues out? And so today, when a pharmaceutical company works with primary hepatocytes, they have about 48 hours to answer questions about um, metabolism in the tissue. And we're able to take these tissues now and take them out to well over a month um, and keep them viable and, and alive over that period of time. Um, and looking here at a couple of the analytes that are liver specific, we're in the process of analyzing these data out, out to um, 38 days here shown for albumin. We've got cholesterol data analyzed out to 10 days and showing that those features are present when the tissues are first made. They are stable over time and retained in the tissue. Um, and this is something that you would not see, again, in the 2D systems. If you look at the cross section of the tissue here, the red color is the albumin showing the nice production of that protein throughout the tissue. And the desmin staining here are the stellate cells that are very much still present at the two week time point of this tissue section. Um, so we're able to make these tissues and they're very living and dynamic and we can carry them out over longer periods of time. And our hope is that becomes a more intelligent system upon which we can ask important questions, whether it's target identification, lead optimization or toxicity questions. So just recapping, you know, this is an automated reproducible fabrication into multi-well plates that uh, pharmaceutical companies can work with. Um, if you look here, you can see in the, in the bottom of the individual well, the little tissue. Um, and so here's a picture, an H&E, a cross section of native liver tissue. And here's our bioprinted tissue. Um, and just as by way of comparison, um, these are hepatocytes seated onto three-dimensional scaffolds, just by comparison. Um, and so you can see that the bioprinted tissue much more closely um, replicates the in vivo morphology um, of the liver than simple uh, cells on the scaffold. So changing gears a little bit as we work with each of these small-scale tissues aimed at drug discovery, we are learning how to build the very basic structures, functional units of a particular tissue. And one of the big questions is, you know, can you begin to scale that and think about things that are implantable? 
And there's no question that there's a, a dearth of, of implantable organs out there today for people with diseases. And, you know, I'm picking on uh, chronic kidney disease because the transplant statistics for this um, are really well defined and well known. So um, as of last week, there are uh, 8,000 kidneys donated over the course of 2013. If you look at how many people are actually on the waiting list to get a kidney, 96,000 people, over 96,000 people on the list to get a kidney. Now, all the people on the list to get the kidney are the sickest patients. So if you go to the people in the United States alone with end-stage renal failure who would be able to take a kidney should they even be allowed on the transplant list, but they're not the sickest patients. They're headed there. They will be on the transplant list at some point in the future. You have over half a million people in the United States with end-stage renal disease that could benefit from having an implantable kidney or some element of function restored to their kidney. Even more sobering, so if you look, uh, chronic, kidney, chronic kidney disease has a very well-defined progression, disease progression path. Once you're beyond stage three of chronic kidney disease, you're headed for dialysis, you're headed for transplant. There aren't a lot of patients that make it back from there. Over eight million people in the United States alone could benefit from having restored functional mass to their kidney. So there's no question that having implantable tissues to address this unmet need is, is of great significance. So how do we get there as a field? I think scaling tissues up to larger size structures is a great challenge. You know, where we see bioprinting potentially playing a role is first in really understanding how to establish microvascular networks in small pieces of tissue, something that we've done across um, a myriad of tissues and tissue types, um, making very simple tubes. So this is a vascular conduit that was um, bioprinted and placed onto a perfusion system where it could mature, and you see the maturation in the wall of the structure here and the laying down of collagen, which you see in blue. Um, and then we start thinking about, well, what if you wanted to make a very large structure? You'd have to start with some type of perfusible vascular tree. And so this is a bioprinted branched vascular conduit um, that we've made. And so as we begin to think forward at how do you take these very small-scale learnings and turn them into something that could impact um, regenerative medicine from the standpoint of implantable tissue, um, the, the roots really lie in being able to understand and drive vascularization. So I'll leave you with that and acknowledge uh, my colleagues here and again uh, the work on the liver done by Ben Shepard and Justin Robbins. And Justin will be presenting a poster uh, additionally on Wednesday of some of the work that has been done with the iPS cells. Thank you. Thank you.